Mom, why don't you give me that? All right. I think everybody's had a chance to kind of look over maybe some questions and things. We want to get a few uh, answers to uh, some questions for uh, for maybe our grandchildren, great grandchildren, and tell them who you were and what you're all about. And we also think it's very rare that uh, what do we have from 83 to 65, 6, 7? What is it? 66. 66. And everybody's still alive. That's very rare to have brothers and sisters. So uh, it's pretty special. We're going to start. Let's just. I might. I might. Well, I, I can't get Merle when you're right there. But you want to step back a little bit. Larry? Or, or, yeah, Larry. I okay. Unless you want to sit right there. I well, could. You want me to? Yeah. Okay. Might as well have it. Senior okay. Ray Paula. What about forgetting so. Maynard? So we'll okay. ask a few questions. Let's just start. Let's start right here and just go around and just answer the question. Yeah. And feel free to embellish somebody else's answer if you want. Do whatever you want to do. This is your day. What's your earliest memories of the farm in your Madison community? Mm, I guess probably the earliest memory I, I had, I was leaving Merle's at Ducks along. You know, you had those ducks out there in the coop. She always bothered them, too, didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> that was my project. I raised pro those ducks projects for what? Because I'd take them to town and sell them every once in a while. I need a little spending money. And uh, I, guess, I think that was the first one, just outside the house there. And, and Merle had some ducks out there north of the house, back on the fence. And, and uh, Mom said, that if you aren't supposed to pick them up, you might choke them. <laughs> I guess that's the first thing I can remember. How old would you have been at that time? Oh, I don't know. Four or five. I don't know. I'll bet you younger than that. I'll bet you were younger than that. Two or three. I don't, I don't really know. Hmm. I'm, I'm, Probably two or three, and I was probably. And one other memory I got, uh, I car carried some pancakes out after breakfast, and uh, uh, we always had eight, eight or ten cats, and I thought I'd make them jump for it, and the old cat got me in that thumb. <laughs> Still carry the scar. <laughs> probably. I can't see it. <laughs> Merle, what do you, what's your earliest memories? Well, <clears throat> Difficult to think of the earliest memory in there, uh, but uh, one of the memories I remember from the farm and it goes back in there was uh, um, that we had these two riding horses. Mm -hmm. They were riding horses, but they were also harness horses. And uh, I was uh, being able to get old enough to where I could get up and go over riding on one of those horses. San and Rex was our names. What well, the names again were? Pardon? What were their names again? Rex, Sam, and Rex. Sam and Rex. Yeah. Sam and Rex, okay. okay. And, uh, and they were actually harnessed. You actually, you hooked them no. up and... Oh, no, I did not. I'm just talking. When I was old enough to be able to get up and ride on one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, was it Rex or Sam that we, that we rode? One you could ride and one you couldn't. Sam we could ride. Okay. And, ride. and Rex lived and, along. And we'd go out, we'd take them out to get the cow. Do you remember that? Yeah. And remember the time that... The, I mm -hmm. fell off the one, and, and then I would get back all the way out in the pasture, way out in the corner of the thing to bring the cows up, and I fell down, I fell off, and we'd, we'd we walked the rest of the way and brought the cattle up. But, but, we'd, uh, but we'd often have to go over to a fence and get up on a yeah. horse and get up on the horse again. You were lucky you had a horse to ride. I had to walk out barefoot after the cows. I'd stop on the way and watch those dung beetles roll a little over the there and roll over the top of the hill. Yeah, they, they sure made those nice and round, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. They darn good marbles, I tell you, to let them dry out. <laughs> any any other memories you have? Oh, you not right at the moment. Okay, there'll be some more that will come back. Mom, Irene, you get the answer for both you and Evelyn. What are your earliest memories? The two of you are just two years apart. We just followed the coys around Kevin out of nature. Well, I, I was telling was sitting beside me, Jack, and he was saying something. I can remember when we didn't, a lot of times when there was something going on, like a funeral or some place to go, we'd all, a lot of times they'd all be at our place. I can remember cousins and everything being at, being at our place is different when there was somebody's funeral, but I don't know what this was. The, the books were all gone, but Wallace and Pauline were there. I can remember Wallace and Merle, you, and I don't know if Maynard was old enough on that or not, and probably not, because they were String it up over it, electricity down the road, you know, and the poles and all the wires. And the folks were gone the bigger part of the day, and when they come up, the boys, you'd, 
you found some old wire out someplace and some nails, and you had that big porch that was around our house, and there was a wooden thing all around it. They had that pretty well mailed, nailed down with all the wire and those nails when they got home from town that afternoon. <laughs> they were going to put some electricity on our porch, I guess. I don't remember. <laughs> I've forgotten that. <laughs> but you're guilty? But you're guilty. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Wallace and I. Oh, that's good. That's good. Evelyn, do you have anything? I think my mind's a blank today. Is it? Well, they'll, they'll come they back. I really kept us busy following the, all the boys around, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we got shoved into things that we didn't want to because the boys could out maneuver you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Anything. We had to do all the work with the team and horses, though. And then the time the tractor came, they got to do the things. You remember the team of mules and their horses we had? We had Jack and Jim. Jim was a feisty one and Jack was a slow one. And We'd have this two row cultivator, corn cultivator. So we'd get to the end of the row and we'd stop and we'd pick up a bunch of clods because we had to keep hitting uh, Jack with it to keep up with Jim to get, so they'd drive even across, across to cultivate the corn. Yeah. I've heard the Jack and Jim story. Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> thing, thing about yeah. his dad had this big team of great perchers who were really steppers. And he, they'd come to the end, they'd whip right around and go back, and if there's anything after 10, 30, or 11, the mules wanted to go to the house, and they wouldn't turn around. They'd fight the bed, <laughs> fight the bed. Yeah. They knew if they turned around, they had to go all the way to the other end of the field and back. <laughs> there was a one rope elevator. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. one time I had them behind the harrow, and Dad was out there doing something, and I turned at the end of the road too quick, and they, uh, or they turned and they flipped the harrow cut over, you know, and then they, so Jim got on and they tore, pulled that hair clear back across the field and I'm standing there bawling. <laughs> Dad was ahead doing, um, I don't know, it was some other piece of machine. He corn. I had a lot of time with huh? Yeah. I don't well, know. We had a lot of warnings not to pull across the wire when yeah. you know, school and going to hair the corn in. I goofed a lot of We didn't make any friends we drove across that check wire. <laughs> Jack. Parts uh, early. Memories, I can only uh, mark them by time, and that one, the first one, I think, anyone remember when Jesse died? Was it 1934? Well, yeah. I, I don't remember Jesse, but I remember standing in the door, door barn at their farm north of Toledo on the day of their farm auction. I don't remember anything else about it except I got cold and they took me in the house. <laughs> but it probably was the uh, spring of 35, right? So yes, yeah, 35. Uh, because that's when uh, Uncle Jesse, uh, well, Grandma, and Grandma Hendrickson died in 35, but Uncle Jesse died the year before that, I think, because so. he died before Grandma did. All right, then I, I go to Grandma Hendrickson, and sometime, I assume, that summer or spring before she died, Mom and I walked from our house across the field to her house. To, to oh, yeah. Now, I don't remember the walk. Except that after we got there and were ready to come home, Grandpa Henryson came in and said, well, how did you get here? And Mom said, well, we came across the field, but when we're going home, we're going around the road. I assume we had trouble getting across Stony Creek out there and noticed where the field somewhere. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the only reason I can remember that, and that marks an early time. And the other, and I remember Grandpa Lang's funeral, which had been 36. And the only reason I remember that is because I think I was sitting, like today, next to these two and one or the other and started crying. Oh. And I didn't know what, why they were crying. <laughs> okay. Good. Pauline. Well, our dads farmed together. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we were just together all the time. My brothers and sisters, Wallace and I. And um, we just shared all these things they're talking about I can remember and I can remember my grandparents both of them very much um, grandma Hendrickson being so crippled up all the time and my mother always picked corn in the fall she helped outside so much and so when I was little I always stayed with grandma Lang all during the daytime and I was just was in that little what they have for the parsonage now is their home and I stayed there so I got well acquainted with my grandpa Lang. I think I think for the audience they don't know you were born in nineteen fifteen and Grandma Lang died in nineteen twenty. So yeah, she's yeah. the only cousin that really knew Grandma Lang. I think. That's right. I was gonna say because she because, died uh, just before I was born, right yeah. after Mary was born. And and Evelyn would have been maybe two. Uh -huh. Okay. So. I don't know. Three or four. Mm -hmm. Those are memories that I have. Mm -hmm. 
being a part of the family and then being the oldest one, I think I kind of had a little advantage. <laughs> they always told me I was spoiled, maybe I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was the oldest one on both sides. Really? Okay. Okay. Good. Around to you, Larry. I think of two things. One, since I was the youngest, <coughs> by the time, um, that time, Dad drove and all my brothers and sisters drove, but I think my mom had quit driving. And for some reason, either Dad wanted Mom to start driving again, or she wanted to start driving again. And we were out on the country road over by Uncle Henry's farm, mm -hmm. and trying to teach her to drive, and she went in the ditch. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think she ever drove again, as far as I know, the rest of her life. <laughs> and the other thing, I had either two evil, sadistic sisters. <laughs> Not they used to dress you up. Either, either thought I was a girl or wanted me to be a girl. <laughs> they would make me sit still to put these curters in my hair. I got some pictures, by the way. Oh, but you were so cute. Like, oh, girl. <laughs> Pretty blonde girl, we girl your hair. Your mother didn't want to give those up either. <laughs> I don't think we really cared. We got to name him. Remember, we got to pick out the name Larry Lee. That, that was a favorite name then. Well, you got Lee yeah, from Gilbert somewhere or other. Apparently, we wanted a Lee girl. Is, so we I think that Lee had something to do with you, didn't it? Well, yeah, I just Gilbert. passed down through my name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that Lee part was from you. So you guys had the three brothers, and it was enough. One, and one little sister then. <laughs> I guess so. It's like my dad always said. Well, he didn't get a middle name. They had two boys, and he was a third boy, and they couldn't think of only one name, so he just got Howie. He didn't get a second name. Did you ever know that? <laughs> That's new, I always um, thought that. They told that all the time. I always felt bad. Sorry for that. <laughs> I always thought his middle name was Nun. <laughs> because his driver's license said Howie Nun Glenn. Right? I always thought his middle name was Nun Glenn. I was how old. <laughs> well, Irene's middle name is Nettie, right? <laughs> Oh, where yeah, are they? Oh, is that Grandma Lang? Oh, that Grandma Lang? Okay. Because that was yeah. Grandma Hendrickson's name. Okay. Okay. They said Grandma Lang's name was Nettie Howie. Howie was a young and then dad, so dad got the, the maiden name. Like okay. Gilford thinks he got the worst one. They couldn't think of nothing. Gilford. <laughs> How many people do you know of the name of Gilford? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, was a I read a couple of books about England, and Gilford was a fairly common name. And I'm afraid my grandmother was English. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's turn to the state fair. I think that was a big part of the uh, family's August, anyway. Tell me your your first recollections of the state fair. Uh, I, I asked earlier about the first trip, and I think everybody went the following August after they were born. So I think that's probably a mute issue, I suppose. That Jack pointed it out. So what what are your earliest memories? Our earliest memories are two things. Our our earliest campground was right down against the hog barn, that fence was right by the hog barn, not way back up the hill. And we were always right inside the gate and down three. And the earliest time I remember going to the state fair, Dad and Mom went up in an old 27 Dodge, wooden spokes. And it was after dark, and Mom turned around and pushed my head down and says, we don't need to pay for you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Before Trump says. It about affected me for life. It gave me an inferior. <laughs> I wasn't worth 50 cents. No, seriously, then the next thing I remember while they were showing hogs, they had the old hog barn. They had kind of bleachers, then you had a place yep. up around the top, and like any kid two or three years old, my time was spent running around that, around that top up there when mm -hmm. they showed hogs down below. So that's, uh, Memories. To build on to that, I yeah. remember when they filmed the first State Fair film up there. Okay. And uh, uh, the Lang family had something to do with breeding the original Blue Boy, who was, well, the boar was originally called the Dyke of Rosedale, but they named him Blue Boy for the film State Fair. But I remember him being in the show ring with the cameras, taking pictures for that State Fair film. Oh, well, that would have been in, in 33 in the or mid 30s. I, I forget exactly. How, I, I think State Fair came out in 36, didn't it? Yeah. And so it would have been a year before yeah, that, probably. Someplace back in there. And anyway, but that's one of the early memories. But but I also remember uh, as uh, having the train wrecks out in front of the grandstand. Mm -hmm. 
and some of the stunt planes that used to come in with the guy standing up on top in the, on this little old biplane. And they, they don't allow any of that anymore, but I can remember when they used to put that show on in front of this grandstand at the fair. And I also remember when Lindbergh first made an appearance at the state fair after he had made his flight across the Atlantic, and then he appeared at various songs, and he made an appearance at the state fair. And I remember that he came there that what, year. 28 or 29 then? And, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was probably seven, eight years old. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but if we got out to the grandstand so we'd get a peek of view, view of him, you know, we was probably a quarter of a mile away, but we saw him. Wow. <laughs> wow. I didn't realize that. Evelyn, do you have any memories of the State Fair? I'd like to share. Lots of them? Open the door somewhere. <laughs> That's our doorbell. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <Your neighbor. laughs> Inviting him, maybe he's got some memories to share. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember things any better than he did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, there was always certain chores that the kids were. Once you got there, sometimes we went in the night and had to all sleep and put us all asleep before they started out in the car. Yes, I don't know. And we would. Divide the great big tent when it was on a platform. How many of you remember that? Oh, yeah, that was after we had this little one down there right inside the, the door. The big, the big I, it wasn't very big, big, but I can remember. Army, big army, big army. Mom, the, the, the other how she got all those kids in there, but we had to stay in there until she was ready for us to get up in the morning. We didn't dare get up and go out anyway until we had some breakfast and we were to go out. There. But it was really, it, at the time those tents all got in there, you know, while the stakes were going over this way on other tents, it was really packed down there first. And remember that? Had the string curtains between the yeah. boys on their side. And then, <laughs> <laughs> if you were big enough to go outside, you had to dig a hole big enough to put the ice in so our milk could stay warm, so we could all cap our milk, whether we were home or not. What else did we do? I don't know. Kept the crickets out that would chew holes in our clothes. <laughs> we didn't get them slaughtered. They were a little at care, and we all had to do when we got to the fairs. Seems like it was anyway. Then after we were married, we even built a platform beside it, beside yep. the crosses. Yep. That was coming up when we built a platform. <laughs> didn't have to dig a trench around, so if it rained that night, we had to run off down the hill. <laughs> How long did you typically stay at the fun. fair? Pardon? A week? Four so days? Five ten days? All the time. Ten, ten days. The whole time? Ten, ten, ten days. days we were up there. And, uh, Can you imagine up? keeping your kid ten days in a tent all of you? <laughs> around with a blanket or a sheet? There was, uh, run out the hill to the bathroom. And it wasn't a plus toilet either. <laughs> it wasn't a plus toilet. Oh, sometimes yeah. we had a little... They bought, the the they, they bought their <laughs> toilet paper on contract, and I'll tell you, it was a long ways from the soft. You had splinters in it. It hadn't been processed yet. <laughs> they haven't got, the wood, they hadn't got the wood turned out of the paper yet. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> in later years, though, when we, well, we're going to talk about that later, I guess. Our okay. grand. This year, you talk about whatever you want. We're just here to ask a few questions. Well, talk about having an indoor bathroom. Gilford's dad was with us in camp. That's when we took a whole big family at 26 went on vacation. The little guy come walking out from down the hill, up the hill. Grandpa was headed up. The little guy ran past him and Grandpa says, hey there bud, wait just a minute. David turned around and looked and he said, did you flush? <laughs> David hated the smell of that place anyway. He didn't want to go there on the first place. <laughs> yeah, that's another vacation. <laughs> hey, well, I wasn't really there. This is quite a lot later, but being a farm kid, you didn't see all the ethnic groups. And one time uh, John saw this black lady and she said, that made you get so dirty. <laughs> he, he never, he down there, he never seen her. Probably two years old or two and a half. Sure. I don't know. Sure. Sure. That all dirty girl yeah. was doing. Yeah. 
But, but they'll just briefly on that. The, the aroma of that, we had a kerosene stove that put on the time, is that what you always had? No kerosene burner? That, that aroma cooking breakfast in the morning, I don't know, the, the dew or something. I, I can still imagine that today. And then the sound of the trains just off to the south of the campgrounds mm -hmm. moving cars around. <laughs> They're a memory you can just almost hear it yet today. The, the cooking of bacon and things is always yeah. a good smell. You can smell that all through the, <laughs> in the early in the morning. Well, I always had, always had bacon. Old, yeah. old camp, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, so I enough, spoke in there more? every time. <laughs> I, I told mine all. Well, okay. I can just remember mom baking cookies and everything, getting ready to go to the state oh, fair. Boy. She'd make oatmeal and she'd have an oatmeal boxes stacked and she'd try to hide them back in some place so we wouldn't need them up before she's ready to take them to the state fair. But, uh, well, there was something else I was going it, uh, it just was something that you, I mean, the last the only vacation we ever we got was to go to the state fair every year, mm -hmm. and we looked forward to it. But uh, in the first year, I can remember I showed hogs, pigs, and me running around there and I was always losing my pig. I couldn't get away from him. I couldn't catch him and keep him there. I liked the, with the cattle a lot better. I got along a lot better with the, leaving the cows around with the, anywhere or calves in there. But um, there was a lot of memories. I remember, remember the year we always, we could go up to the state fair and probably spend the whole 10 days, less than a lot of our friends who would go up for one day or maybe two, and spend less money because there were just a lot of free things to do. And there were just, or one treat, if it was a good day though, we got to go over to this stand around the Hippodrome and get ice cream and bring home for supper. There were little ice cream sundaes in a little can. That was a treat way back then. Really but nice remember, we'd go to the, to the um, yeah, ice ice Women's and Children's Building. There was always something going on. And the biggest thing we liked was to go, <laughs> they had the baby's health contest. And they'd have it every, from 10 to oh, what, something. Yeah, there remember, was Larry was in that. You remember one year? <laughs> oh, we, we had to get him entered in that cow's contest. I lost out because my teeth were good. <laughs> <laughs> Why did he a dentist? He was real proud. Our brother won that contest. There were all the little guys there. How old, how old would Larry have been at that time? When you already been to one, contest? One how old was he when you entered? Well, the they they had two ages. They had twelve to twenty-four months, and twenty-four months to thirty-six months. There were there were three different oh, okay. groups, and there were kids that went through. And okay. it was all in behind a big glass thing. Did you, and you the have to do his hair up real nice? Then, for that he time? was in. I suppose you were between a year, a year and a half, a year and a half old. I think that. To be the youngest, huh? <laughs> Pauline, do you have some memories? Were you, were you guys, did you all stay together? Yes, I wondered if anybody was going to bring that up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, going back a little bit, our grandparents, Grandpa and Grandma Lang, went every year. So these folks, all of our dads, <laughs> it was in their blood mm -hmm. to go. But they went long before we ever went and showed hogs and cattle. I have pictures of them when, and their friends would come up and they'd have watermelon beans and all that sort of thing. Then coming back to when we were little, because we had a tent, a great big army tent, and uh, it was divided in four parts. So there was Alan and Alec and Henry and Jean mm -hmm. and Luba and Nist. Russell, 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 Russell and Agnes. Right. And we each had a compartment, and every year you rotated, because nobody liked to be clear in the back or in the front all the time. So you rotated. One year you were here, and next year you were here, and now. But can you imagine you young people taking one or two children and living in a quarter of a tent like that? <laughs> and everybody with you, and if one baby cried, everybody heard it. <laughs> and it was just fun. But they mentioned all these things, and mm -hmm. we could go as children. We were free after we checked in with our parents, but we could go any place on the fairground and look around behaved ourselves, but we could not go to Midway. We would stay out of Midway. But otherwise, we could go wherever we want. I was good to have Curly shows up there. They did take us one trip always to, to Midway, our mm -hmm. parents did. But otherwise, that was off limits, because you didn't know what ball you'd get into. <laughs> and, and you always obeyed. You guys never went yeah, to Midway then? Yeah, we never thought about it. We could go out around the racetrack and go 
who was the old guy that won the races back in those days? Emory Collins. Emory and Collins and Gus Schrader. Yeah. Yeah. around there and they go around and you just smell that old fuel burning and throwing dirt up over our heads. And you know how they saw all that? Over the yep. You know how they saw all that? Uh, uh, they stood around the outside of the fence yes, and peeked yeah. in. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So it's initiative. Larry, the earliest memories. Well, they, they quit the, everything's been told. They, they quit the state fair either in 40 or 41. At Pearl Harbor until... Or did they have it in 41? Well, one year there was such a epidemic of uh, polio. 42, they didn't have but I can remember going back in 46, would it have been, and Jack and I going up. I can remember that smell of the black top, the pig barns, and walking down through there, the smells I still remember from when I was little. It's about the only thing I remember before the war. <laughs> but you're talking about Blue Boy. They had this play, the State Fair here, the musical here a few years ago in Des Moines. And John Davidson played the musical, the male lead. So they had a cast party afterwards, and we went down to it. And so I went up to John Davidson, and I said, you know, my, my father and his brothers and his brothers and I, you know, they raised this blue boy that was used in the thing, and he, okay, turned around and walked away. He couldn't <laughs> care less. <laughs> I thought it was kind of interesting. <laughs> he didn't, wasn't really interested. <laughs> and they had used that cattle barn for storage for uh, army equipment. And yeah. when we, when before the war, it was all dirt floor. We even used to play golf when we got, we drill a hole in dirt floor and we play golf at the class or something. But after the war, it was all cement floor. We cemented it all for army ordnance. Yep. Hmm. Now everybody went to the fair, so who stayed home to do the chores and the, the You had a hired man. You had a hired man. One year, uh, one year we had a, a married couple that came there, and she had a retired couple. Who was that? Do you remember who that was? Dick Somebody. Lamb was the only one I can remember. Well, Edgar Buffin was it. Dick Williams is one of her strong anger member Malcolm, Dick and Bob. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did. We had problems. Of course, we did. We weren't milking that many cows then. There was yeah, was Jasper. 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 Jasper.
is that you? <laughs> they showed it to me. I didn't know if it was going to be in there. They, this was taken off at the State Fair in Des Moines. This, he had come and he was writing something about the Iowa State Fair in Iowa. I didn't, I didn't see that. Mm -hmm. He was just telling me a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. The rest of you knew that? Yeah, I, I know she got her picture in. And I remember the day, <laughs> day uh, they took it in the <laughs> afternoon. And uh, they they were there doing a, a feature article on the state fair, Random, right? Uh, National Geographic was that the reason? Well, I don't know what I mean. I don't know what, what they were doing. Something article on the state the fair when they were doing. I remember standing there, I mean, going out for having the picture taken, but I'd forgotten all about it because it was a year before it came out in the National Geographic. Yeah. So it was, what what year was that? Thirty eight. Copy of it, huh? Thirty eight. So maybe it was thirty seven. Yeah. Then I took it thirty seven. Yeah. Yeah. Did any of you get that book that her plan background had that? Yeah. There, Joanne got a copy. Or she heard that somewhere. And when she wrote him, she, you tell my voices. She went to where Berkeley they were selling these books and told him that she was a granddaughter of Holly Lang. And Herb took it from there and he wrote about a page in the front of that book before she bought it. I think she has it, yeah. Do, I wonder how they got that book. picture of our of the four dads, and it's called the Big Four Farms mm -hmm. and the Little yeah. Four Farms, all that. It was before them. I don't think we showed any cattle that year. How many years did they sell, sell the, show the hogs up there? and then? Oh, they've been showing hogs for many years before we started showing cattle. <clears throat> yeah, I know that, but I wondered how... Now this had to be because it was Wallace and you and and uh, Marion. Marion was the oldest, and then well, we Wallace showing, and then you we and then James. We were showing hogs then, but we weren't showing cattle. No, no, because well, you guys are just little, yeah. two, three, and four year olds. What year was the dad brought that first hair shirt back? From, uh, 27, 27. He traded three gilts for three heifers. Oh yeah, down in Peoria. The Secretary of the Hampshire Swain Association had them. And they were showing how this was 21 at least. Because that's when all this was Okay. And then, well, yeah. yeah. Any other memories of the state fair you'd like to share? Or should we? I can remember my mother had a list of things that she kept from year to year that had to go to the fair. And every year when we came home, that went in a certain drawer in the buffet. And then when it got fair time, my outcomes list and we start getting it all collected again so we didn't forget something. My mother used to start painting the feed pans and brooms and brushes. And she would line them all out and have everything painted and ready to go and the beds and mattresses. And well, I spent a week, we drug mattresses and springs and everything up there too on top of Kids and blankets yeah. and food. And Most likely, four wheel trailer followed my fist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you remember coming home? Well, we got after we got home. We get home. The fair was the last 10 days of out of August. And we get home just before school would start. I mean, it started the day after Labor Day. Oh, but then all those blankets had to go on the clothesline and hung up and all that stuff, all taken out before it could be folded and put away. And then the grass was always this yay high. Somebody had to be mowing the lawn right away because it hadn't been mowed for 10 days. And there was a job for all of us to get everything unpacked and get ready, and then be ready to start the school the first of the following week that went following in Following Monday. <laughs> we do that now. School starting in August. Yeah. Already. I think I just one last thing there on the fair. I doubt that in those days any of us ever took a bath or shower while we were at the fair. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think there were ever any clothes washed. <laughs> Well, times were different then. <laughs> I just want to find it out. <laughs> you used to take a bath at a big thing set in the middle of the kitchen floor on, on Saturday night, Where and they'd have Where some water it. heating, and when the next guy got in to pour a little more hot water in, four or five of us took a bath in that same tub of water. Four why five. wouldn't? Why our kids today would have fits they when they would be crazy. And Irene and Merle and me, time we got down to Jack and Larry, there was a pretty good ring around there. <laughs> Stove going. There's always yeah. a kettle of hot water. I'll, I'll, I'll disagree with you on that. The girls went first, and then they started the little guys. 
Yeah, and we were the dirtiest. We wound up last. Yeah, that's why the ring was there. That's right. Well, that's why the ring was there. So that's right. Let's, let's put a disclaimer in here. Now, the, no, these stories aren't embellished. They're just, yeah. they're just the facts. Just the facts. Thank you. Yes. yes. Yeah, it was before be detergent soap, too. So yeah. The ring was pretty... Yeah, lye, lye, soap, lye soap made pretty good ring. Yep. <laughs> Chronologically, then, uh, let's let's move up to the Depression. We kind of talked about the 20s, maybe started the 30s and some things here. Does, I'm sure some of you remember the crash in 29 and and then subsequently the Depression. And What are your memories well, of that era? They talked about it, but, you know, we really didn't realize what, what was going on for sure, did we? We didn't you know how far we were. <laughs> no. But everybody, well, we nobody had, any, had much money, uh, you know, and as far as clothes and things, I mean... Just handing them down to the next one. And we had food to eat. Uh -huh. We didn't notice. No, it didn't, didn't bother us. There were there were there were some hard times. I mean, uh, uh, for for that, but uh, it was worse in what years? You started high school. I started in '32. There were some years. It was kind of that was the year I graduated. Or in high school, and we had to. <clears throat> we didn't get to have yearbooks and a lot of things that we had to put up. And I know I graduated in a borrowed dress because we couldn't afford a new, we had to have a white dress and things like that. But <clears throat> like they say, we lived on the farm and there was plenty to eat. And I don't think we felt it like city people did. But we had learned what it was to do without and to save and utilize. <clears throat> and I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that makes us still hang on to that. It does with me and I know it does with us. I think that period of time, we remember the drought more than we remember the That was in 36? Well, the drought 34. 34, 34 36, 36 yeah. on in there, the drought. And you had some bad winters in there, too, I that's, think. Yeah, 36 was a terrible winter. Yeah. yeah. That's the year we dug out. Uh, that affected us more than... Right. I think it did, too. Mm -hmm. what, were, what were the, what specifically, what were the effects of the 34 drought? Well, I remember carrying water out to Dad and found the corn and never did get over this tall. I don't know whether it was 34, 35, or 36. 36 was the hottest, but 34 was as dry. Yeah. 34. I remember taking the cows, they'd eaten all the grass in the, in the pasture, up and, down and, the and up and down the roadside, yeah. herding them up and down the roadside to, to eat, find some grass to eat. And we would uh, go out and, after we fed the, what corn we had to the pigs, go out and gather up all the cobs, because that's what burned in the furnace and the stove for our heat. A lot of times they did smell too good. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't notice. No, but you know, even though we were short, when it came Easter time, you know, we all had something new to wear. When it came Christmas time, there was a gift for everybody. It was only a quarter or a dime. We all went to town shopping one day come out of the store, maybe you'd have a box of crayons, maybe you'd have a handkerchief. But every cousin, and that included the cousins from Aunt Ruth's yeah. you know who I'm talking about. But everybody got a gift. Nobody was left out, a little, and nobody complaining, and it was a happy group. <laughs> we often made those gifts. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yes, we did. More important. Colored pictures or whatever. Mm -hmm. Good. Any other thoughts about the 30s? Uh, yeah, probably the toughest part. We'd, we'd wait, folks take a case of eggs and cream. We'd have, all have to wait around there when I got some money, and then they'd give Merle a nickel or a dime, and I had to share it with him. And <laughs> so we'd go to Rexaw and we'd get a root beer and two straws. He sucked faster. <laughs> you need to take lessons from the guy who we got the a, soup. We got a nickel candy bar, and he broke a one third and two thirds. <laughs> he lowered me. That's why I'm smaller. I'll be the only reason I'm still alive is when they mar Mars and some of them split them in half factory, you know, and I got my share. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. The abuse. Yeah. Terrible. Yep. Uh, moving ahead to uh, Pearl Harbor. Do you remember where you were when you first heard about Pearl Harbor? Let's just start with Maynard here and move around. Yeah, I was in I was going to Grinnell High School, and the whole talk that way, the kids were thinking about it and by that afternoon. Really? 
I started in 125 and uh, we finished with uh, 100 and I would say, oh, probably some dropouts, but I would say there's 18 or so enlisted between their sophomore and junior year. Mm. And uh, of course the seniors, they're all going to get in the, and some of them you'd know, uh, the Jim Lincolns and the Charlie Marions and the Ken Sweeney's, they were seniors and they were going to get in the Air Force and be pilots. And, you know, it's just some, some of them did, yeah. Yeah, some of them did. And the th other thing, yeah, that, that's Pearl Harbor. And then later on, the class ahead of me, um, most of the kids were 16 or 17 and they graduated. And the next year they reached the draft. And I remember a lot of that class ahead of me at 42. They reached 18 and 43 and 44. And it was just unbelievable the amount of them that got went overseas and got pushed into the Battle of the Bulls and they didn't last 30 days. Really? Uh, either they froze or they got killed. Mm. Mm. Merle, do you remember where you were? Yeah. Wallace and I were at the Frisbee house in, at Iowa State College. And, you know, first, well, it was my first year of college. It was his second year in uh, Pearl Harbor. And that, that was right on the same weekend at Mother and Dad's 25th wedding anniversary. Okay. And uh, so uh, I remember it very vividly that uh, that's where I was. Gilbert, Evelyn? Yeah, I remember where I was. I was farming at the time. I went down to Dad's to help him with something, and he said, uh, before we do anything, he said, I want you to go down and talk to Tommy, my younger brother. And I said, what's the matter? Well, he said he got word from Pearl Harbor about Pearl Harbor, and he says, Tommy's finished the chores and he's going to go. He had a hip that was bothering him. He couldn't even sit, he couldn't even get down, squat down. He, and he got clear out in California. He signed up and went clear out there. And uh, they noticed that he, when he started to squat down to shoot and it's some kind of training, he put that leg out. An officer come along and said, uh, why don't you do it right? He says, I can't. He got that far. And they, and they sent him home. But Tommy was so mad that day that there was no way of changing his opinion of what he should do. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Irene? Yeah, I can remember. I was in Chicago. I had uh, quit Ames that fall, and two friends had Virginia Blakely. Well, I knew her. She called back and wanted to know why I didn't come in Chicago and work in this. It was a, a place where mothers could leave their babies if they had to work during the things or they could come. I mean, if they were working during the war and everything, but you worked, you didn't, didn't get a whole lot of money. But we stayed there and got our room and board and everything at this place. can't remember. Anyway, and it was sitting in the little room that I had there. It wasn't long about on Sunday evening, long about five, six o'clock. And I can remember hearing it on the radio I had in there. And I just, I thought, oh, terrible. And I was running around trying to tell these other ladies, well, Virginia, and there was a girl from Ames that worked there, and there was another one. Because we had, I had worked in the place where there were, I had about, one time I had 15 kids from one to three years old that I was responsible for all day long. Anyway, the mothers would bring them in there. 7 8 o'clock in the morning, then pick them up around 4 or 5 in the afternoon. And Virginia had, Blakely was, she was in the nursery. She had where there were little babies. And then there were kids that were in just about, then like 4 and 5 before they started the school. Then the, anyway, in this place. But I can remember being in there in Chicago that Sunday afternoon and hearing that over the radio. <laughs> but I didn't remember. It was a, it was an, it wasn't the folks. Oh, yeah, December 7th. December 7th. Yeah, December 7th. 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 December 7th.
think we had heard it before we went to church on the radio. Mm -hmm. But uh, how different it was in prayer. We were in the dairy, so um, I nailed with us over the age we were married. But, um, so he was sort of exempt because um, our work was mm -hmm. working as well. Mm -hmm. You remember it? Yeah, I can kind of remember them talking about it. It was a Sunday afternoon. It's, for some reason, I wanted to say that Stella Dallas was on and they broke in, but I can't imagine Stella <laughs> Dallas being on on a Sunday afternoon. So I don't know what was on. But I remember the old radio sitting there and we yeah. would have been in the same place, wherever it was. Yeah. I remember that happening. How, how did the family help during the war effort? Or your families? Do you remember anything specific about that? Huh? No, he wants to know how the family helped out with them during the war effort. I know we what? all had coupons. Did we? Yeah, what do you remember about the rationing somebody? and stuff like that? But I don't think anyone suffered too bad. I mean, or at the school we had to go. We had to go collect uh, huh? the toothpaste. Pardon? You had to take back an empty toothpaste container. No, I'm talking about off. what was the thing they made parachutes out of? The uh, uh, milkweed fluff. Yeah, milkweed. milkweed thing. We dope it in sacks, Take collected off. milkweed had things. The, uh, they made the life jackets. Life jackets. Oh. And then also we collected hemp because the Philippines had been draided, and that was our source for hemp, which made rope, which really is marijuana. Yeah. <laughs> and so we were collecting hemp along the roadsides. <laughs> you right now. <laughs> Early I can remember in our country school, we had to take sacks and go collect those two mm -hmm. things. No, I don't remember at all. But you are in No. And we couldn't get any hose. Couldn't get any hose. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. We made oh. clothes out of feed well, sacks. Well, we didn't have yarn. We, even silk hose, we couldn't get. No, we couldn't get any. Feed sacks had patterns on them. So we say and we all of our shirts. The war. <laughs> Maybe they didn't before the war, but I remember during the war because all of our shirts were made out of feed sacks. They <laughs> they looked for sacks that had nice patterns. And, that, and then mom would make shirts out of them. That's what we had for shirts. Well, we had. Sheets and pillowcases and a lot of stuff made out no feed sacks in. <laughs> those that did serve, years. or what did you do during those war years? You I served then. Well, I was I was telling Chris before. I, I wanted to get in the in the Air Force, but I was colorblind and it wouldn't take me. But I did get in, attached to a unit that was training Air Force cadets on ground instruction. Mm -hmm. So I did that. I took me down to Florida and then over to Brazil, but then when they, when we were through training the Brazilian cadets and they took over the school, then they put me in the infantry. So that's where I wound up. Okay. How long were you in Brazil then? Well, I was down, I was down in Brazil uh, six, eight months, but I did that other for about a year and then I was in the, uh, actually in the active part of the army for about two and a half years. You remember any Portuguese? Yeah, yeah, a little bit, but when you don't use it, we had to we had to take a quickie course because we taught our classes in Portuguese. So we had a quick course on translating, particularly the technical terms uh, for aviation, aeronautics instruments in particular. But uh, I was teaching at the Escola Tecnica of Aviação São Paulo. São Paulo. I remember writing letters to you down there. And uh, so, <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Anything else during yeah. World, yeah. during World War II? Well, I came home from this nursery school then because it was too small. They were going to move it way out in another part of Chicago. And so then I was home during the summer and then a friend of mine who went to Ames says, come down to Cedar Rapids and work for Collins Radio. So I applied. We didn't have to know much because I hadn't had any kind of training in, in typing in business, you know, or anything. But then you can get, I got in as a file clerk really that quick working for Collins Radio then, or in Cedar Rapids. So I went over there and worked. And then then we worked there how long? And then the, this girl and I, we thought, well, shoot, this is boring. <laughs> so we took off. And, and of course, if you were on a job where they had anything to do with the things, well then you were frozen at that job, so for six months you weren't supposed to get another job. Anyway, but we took off and went down to Miami, Florida, and went down there. Well, we finally got, Mac helped us get, get a job. <laughs> anyway, and we were, it was all civilians on one place, and it was 
the Air Force on the other place. And we tore down C-50, we didn't tear them down, but I mean, it was on the C-54 cargo ships. And they tore them down and they brought us in great big exhaust pipes. There were four big ones because they were big in there for us. And then this big place, I know uh, her name was Clara, we called her Corky. Corky and I were down there with my family for six months. We had a good time anyway. But uh, we had to examine them all for cracks or anything in them. And then we had to mark them and then they were sent to somebody else to do weld them or whatever they did to them anyway. And that was that was quite an experience. Where, where did you learn that you had, a, you had a socket set? Sometime when you came home from one of your jobs, you brought Well, that's probably down there in Florida. Okay, she brought home a, a, a socket set. And we didn't even have such a thing on the farm. <laughs> sure. That, I think that was around there, clear into the mid-50s before it got home. Probably <laughs> But she brought back from her, her war job. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a cute story, but he Go ahead and share it if you'd like. Well, this has to do with ROTC, and this is way back, way back in 32 and 33. And, mm -hmm. and ROTC is a wonderful thing for, to train you to be a, a serviceman. The first year was fine. Everybody, you know, all this marching and polishing boots and the whole bit, all up to line. The second year, then we got to handle the horses, to pull the caissons and stuff around and do that kind of work. And that got to be kind of fun for us farm boys. We came to a practice one day, and when they passed out all the horses, it must have been 30 or 35 of them in that group of horses. And there were that many boys involved, too. And the biggest share of them knew what a horse was, but they had never ridden them. And it just so happens we had one colored boy out of Des Moines. And I don't think he'd ever seen one before. So we had this big corral, and you know, you, they couldn't get out of it. Board fences all around that big corral. And everybody was doing what the officer said. You'd trot around, and you'd do this and that. Well, this colored boy took a hold of the saddle, and they got him. Then they got to going faster on a trot. And the reins were too loose for him. He got to go in this way. And of course, we had on spurs, and every time he rocked in that saddle, he hit that horse. <laughs> and he kept going faster and faster. So then the order came to park their horses. I don't know what the words were. Everybody got over to the side, and this boy was cleaning around that thing 40 miles an hour, you know. And Lieutenant Day gave an order for one of the volunteers. And a friend of mine, farm boy, we'd ridden horses bareback and all that stuff. We were foolish enough to pull out and volunteer. So we took after him, and when Parker went by me, he says, I'll get a front, you crowd him. So he went right by us, and he got that horse in next to that wood, and got him slowed down a little, and I crowded in to that boy, and he got off, that pretty just fell off that horse when he got him stopped. And if you ever seen a white colored boy, he was... <laughs> 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 Um, you brought up something earlier, Pauline, but, but, and maybe you can share some, somebody else. Uh, do you remember your grandparents? What can you tell us about, about, the, uh, about the grandparents on, uh, on both sides? And uh, I think Mom's told me a story a time or two about the, the missus. Was that the second? I remember you talked about that or something. About what? The missus? Yeah, second oh, wife. The second wife? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Yes, well, not have that. Uh, okay. <laughs> let's, just, let's just move on what, you, what your memories are about the grandparents. With me? Yes. Well, um, they were kind of different. Grandpa and Grandma Hendrickson were very frugal. I mean, they had come over uh, when they were 18 or 20 from Norway and uh, by themselves and met after they lived here in the United States and uh, were married. But So they always kind of lived a quiet, frugal life. Now, Grandpa and Grandma Lang were a little different because Grandpa Lang wanted the very best. And I can remember a funny thing because he painted his buildings up at where Jack was. But he never painted the back side of the barn because nobody saw that anyway. <laughs> I mean, that was something that kind of different, you know. And uh, he always had, as soon as it came out, he had a nice car. <coughs> And it just was a little different about 
but they were both very dear. And Grandma Lang was a very strong lady. I mean, she was a, she always spoke her mind, but she was very sure of what she said before she spoke. And uh, if you remember Aunt Jean, she was a lot like her mother. And I'm happy to say they say that about me. <laughs> so we see. But let's see. Grandpa Lang lost Grandma when she was, it was during the flu season. She got up to take care of Aunt Jean with her new baby. And she came down with the flu. Is that in 18 or 20? Or? <laughs> 1920. 1920. 1920. Okay, the year I was born. Okay. okay. And that Mary was, was born ahead of two months or three before yeah. me married. But. So that was her. And then he did marry a second time. And it was kind of different. And <laughs> we all had different ideas. But uh, then that didn't work out. So Grandpa lived with various ones of his sons and daughters at various times with Uncle Russell's and us. And grandpa, grandpa, your grandpa passed away in 36? I don't right? remember the date. Some yeah. of them are more on that than I. Yeah. And Grandpa Hendrickson, like I say, he was a hard-working man. He, uh, I can remember him being so sure that his weeds needed cutting around his fence lines and things. And he would go out and scythe those weeds and come back just dripping wet because it was so hot. And he never, you know, never shirked his deal. I have his little book that kept track of what he paid for things for one whole year. Really? And it's uh, it's just pretty precious if mm -hmm. any of you want to see it. The prices they paid for a bushel of oats and stuff like that. And what he might have gotten when he sold it. And grandma too. She always had the coffee pot on the back of the stove. And I don't mean <coughs> a nice glass one like we have. <coughs> she had the old coffee pot. The ground parson. Big parson on the enameled one. <coughs> enameled. And uh, every, if it got weak, she added a little more coffee. <laughs> and um, then when she got sick in bed, uh, they thought she shouldn't have coffee. And the doctor said she has had coffee all of her life. That coffee isn't going to hurt, so she had her coffee. But they were, they were quite different. But I sure had, oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any memories about the uh, grandparents? She ended on Grandpa Hendrix, and I can remember as a child eating him there. And coming from Europe, he held his <laughs> fork upside down and pushed his food on with his knife onto his fork, you know. And that's good peas and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And everything. I, I couldn't see how he did it. It didn't switch hands either. either. Exactly. He was right-handed. You'd push it over here and you'd win in your mouth left handed. It was fascinating to watch him. Remember how he liked little sardines out of the can? <laughs> you remember the load of fish he served oh. on Christmas Day? Oh. And our fathers couldn't stand it. <laughs> but he, uh, he moved into Grinnell then by the time I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And of course at that time, you, high schoolers went over town during the noon hour, and I'd run on playing it. He'd always stop and visit with, you know, a high school teenager, and he'd always stop and visit. I remember one thing you were talking about when Grandma Hendrickson was very ill and was bedridden, and we'd go over there, and Mother would take us kids along, the ones that uh, were the right age or whatever, and we'd always have to go in the house and say hello to Grandma first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she'd reach out where she was laying, she'd reach over, and she'd grab hold of your hand. And she would squeeze it so hard, it hurt my hand. You know, really, it really hurt it, but I didn't dare say anything. Yes, Grandma, I'm fine. <laughs> and finally she let go, and Mother would say, well, now you go on outside and stay out, but keep out of Grandpa's left way. Yeah. And we stayed just as far away from Grandpa Henderson as we possibly could. <laughs> yeah, well, we didn't always. Remember the time we got the horse tank, and he, came and he really gave us that. <laughs> yeah. Get, get the horse tank. <laughs> we stayed away from him. <laughs> One time I, I was a, definitely afraid of him. I pulled a branch on an apple tree down to pick an apple and I cracked it. And boy, he gave me what for. <laughs> <laughs> he always used to let the butter and the milk down the well. Yeah, I remember that well. That was the way they kept it cold. Now, but do you know why he didn't like them in the tank? Because yeah. he was afraid of the Aunt Stella and all the girls uh, had been to church service and they've had evangelistic meetings and they had baptismal service. So the next day they decided they, they would have theirs and they baptized the cats. <laughs> the cats. Yeah. I see. I see. Okay. Now I point out here just for uh, history, and 
uh, that Grandma Henriksen's funeral was held on the out south on the south side of the house. He, I mean, it was something you don't see very often in a, a, a home funeral. Mm -hmm. The only other one come to mind would be Marilyn, uh, the Pauline's daughter that died. Uh, that was a home funeral. Yes. Uh -huh. That's the only two home funerals I ever remember mm -hmm. attending. I wondered about that the other day when I heard about talk about how it is called. She's improving. You mean Paul Henderson? Yes. She got kicked by a horse. Who did? Paul Henderson. County Fair. Oh. Any, any other stories about uh, grandparents? I just never remember Grandma Hendrickson only pushing a chair around to get around or a cane. She was arthritic, so mm -hmm. she had varicose veins or something real bad. They fall apart in a series of old strokes is why she was. We're going to go to Grandma's cooking right now. What, tell me about. Okay. Uh, Stop. When we get the camera. Are we ready? <coughs> okay. What, what, was, what was your favorite meal that Grandma made? Favorite meal that Grandma made? Our mother. Yes. Our mother. Yes. Well, I don't know in particular, but it seemed like every time we went up there to make hay or anything, she was just insisted on sending something home with us. Sure. Might have been pie. It might have been baked beans. Or that, I marvel at the uh, food today and how we kept it. I mean, ate right. I can remember. <laughs> We'd be short, and the cow would drive in along about 5 o'clock, and Mom would say to us, go out there and catch a chicken out there. So at that time of day, we'd go out and catch that chicken, chop its head off, take the feathers off and bring it in, put it in some cold water, and then have it fried. We'd be eating along about 7 o'clock. <laughs> you know, if you didn't have an axe to chop its head off, you stepped it off. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> I think Grandma did. No, I didn't have enough strength for that, but I've stepped on it, on the head, and pulled it off. <laughs> and then the chicken would flop all over with everything. <laughs> Free range, they call them today. Free yeah. range. We had, we, had, we had pie today. It was very good. Uh -huh. But none of it matched Aunt Ellen's sour cream raisin pie. That was the best. That was the best. Oh, I love sour cream raisin. I bet they didn't have that, did they? Did they make that today? There's very few places that you can find yeah, it. Yeah, you don't find it. That was the best. Mm -hmm. I loved that sour cream yes. so raisin pie. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can remember when we would be working together, your mom always had grape juice mixed with the lemonade. She always had a lot of grape juice. Then she always made these cookies that were a spice cookie, a drop cookie. She never a great big tin of them. But she just boil sugar and water and a little bit of milk and boil it, you know, and it'd get about right. She'd beat it a little bit, and then she'd put that hot frosting on top of those, those with raisins in it, have raisins in. They were the best cookies right out there. We didn't have chocolate chips at that way back then. They were hermit cookies. And you know what my kids called the frosting was cement frosting. <laughs> <laughs> she always had cookies, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can remember they made pie, made pie crust. You always wanted some left over because you'd roll it out and put cinnamon and brown sugar or sugar on it and bake it. So you hope there's a lot left because you had a big yeah. piece of that. Yeah. Right. Depending on who was home would be how big of that piece you got. Nowadays <laughs> <laughs> you can't eat that because there's an egg in there probably somewhere. Mm -hmm. you can't eat it yeah, day. that's right. But I can remember walking home from school and mom would be taking the rolls and the donuts out of the oven. Oh, boy, there's nothing that was better than those homemade rolls. And sometimes she'd take off a big hunk and twist them or deep them in deep fry. Deep fat fry, you know, lard, lard, no. <laughs> and no, we'd sure. have raised donuts to eat, you know, and and but that jelly, homemade jelly, and those biscuits just warm out of the oven when we walk home from school. Yeah, oh, that used to be fun. They would go out to the cherry tree and pick cherries and go sit <laughs> on the cement <laughs> barefoot and get the cherries, the cherries in the seat. You'd have Juices. cherries here and Juices thing to put the pits here and the and the other things here, and you'd sit there in that big front porch out there, that uh, cement porch there, would we, we sit down there with those things in front of us and pick those cherries. <laughs> to this day, I don't 
say I don't like cherries. <laughs> oh, I like we cherries. used to have some peach trees out north of the house. We do. Oh, no. they, yeah, they, the they, original they, ones were south of the house, they, and then we put out the next ones north of the yeah. house. Uh -huh. If they didn't get worms in them, those were great peaches. It's always yeah. ready about cattle corners time. Yeah. I think when we're on the uh, food story, food line there, we should hear the contrasting stories of uh, lunch in the cornfield. I think oh. that's what I can tell. I think it does be recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, can tell his, Larry can tell his version. Yeah, well, usually, you know, you didn't have thermos, so water come out in a Cairo can, half gallon, <laughs> Cairo can. And then when you got your fill, you'd hang it on a hook there in front of the cultivator or somewhere, and you'd have it till it got so hot you couldn't drink it. But, and I was back in the back, our farm was divided up in 20s and 40s, and if they're back in the back corner, and Larry, let Larry come out there with lunch, and he was supposed to bring something to eat and a drink about 2.33 in the afternoon. I, saw, I finally saw him coming down the hill and up the hill back over there, that back corner field. So I waited for him, and he handed the water up and let me out and bring anything to eat. And yeah, he pulled this little state fair metal box. He had a metal in, and inside there he had about two radishes and two little carrots. <laughs> <laughs> Quite frankly, he always liked them, but they weren't my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll never forget that. They were in that little velvet carton. I think we might have got a four eighths of the with the metal in it, you know. There lay those two radishes and those two carrots. <laughs> it taken quite a while to get there. The water was already warm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah let's, let's hear the other side of the story here. The story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get to defend yourself. <laughs> it was after school, and you were out in the field, and I got home from school, and Tom said, you know, you can go out there and ride with me, so I figured you want something. I had three radishes. <laughs> <laughs> and I got on there, and he saw that, and he kicked me off that tractor so quick, and said, get back to the house and get me some cookies or something. <laughs> I didn't get to ride at all. I had to go back to the house from the back of the <laughs> uh, Just a footnote to that, I think yes. Larry, Larry always, or Maynard and I went to a cookie jar, Larry would go to the refrigerator and pull out radishes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other food stories? No, it used to be when Jack and I had, we always slept back in the Northwest room up there. And, uh, two things. One thing, first thing we come downstairs, we look up on top of the refrigerator. Mom always kept her chocolate cake up there and a lot of frosting on. We get a piece of cake before we get on the milk. But the big thing was that Dad would get up and come in the room and call us. Then he'd go downstairs and shake the furnace, and we'd hear the furnace shaking. And he'd holler up through the washroom, call us again. But we never bothered to get out of bed till that door slammed. <laughs> uh, we just ignored the first call and the second call, and the door slammed with Jack and I had. So one day he went down and he came in and called us, and pretty soon we heard that door slam, and Eric, and Larry, and I, and Jack and I tore downstairs to the washroom, and there sat Dad on this old radio. We had a radio that had been discarded, and the lid's still open. We kept gloves in there. Remember that mm -hmm. thing yeah. sat out there? Yep. At water camp. There sat Dad on that just to chuckle him, because he hadn't even, he hadn't even stoked the furnace yet. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember in high school, the same way. I was in that room, and you guys were gone. I was the only one home. And <coughs> Dad would yell at me and yell, and I'd go back to sleep. He came in the room and yelled at me, and I thought, oh, gee, I'm really, I got up. Went downstairs and started putting my clothes on. Well, I had been out late something at high school, came home and fallen asleep in the bed, and he came in to yell at me to turn the light out and go to bed. <laughs> I thought he was yelling at me to get out and go to milk the cows in the morning. So I was down there, and it was probably... 1.30 or 2 in the morning, putting my clothes on, getting ready to come down. What are you doing? <laughs> a good lead in for the next for the next topic. Which what do you what's your when you think when you think of your father, which what memories come to mind? Well dad had a just a natural ability to at least us four boys. He didn't ever get conceited around him. He'd bring him back down there, grassroots pretty quick, and do it. He he's very even-minded. 
Very steady. You're very fair. Uh, Mom was aggressive and she considered laziness in about the same category as an older end. You were lazy, you were any better than an older. <laughs> you, if you were around there, you better work. And that, that was a different. Mom was driven and dad was more or less a moderator and even tempered. That's a very good description. Uh -huh. I, I've told some people, Dad, I don't think he ever told me what time to get home at night. I just had to get up at 4.30 and go milk cops. Yep. Yeah. And one time, I think it was when I graduated from high school, we'd gone to Des Moines after the graduation and came back and I got home really late. And I still had to get up and milk the cows. We got through milking the cows and he said, I'm going to go back and take a nap. <laughs> About 7.30. <laughs> You don't have to go back in the house and sleep for a couple hours. Uh, good way to handle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'd like Pauline to comment on her folks. She yep. was, to, to me, they were uh, second father and mother. Mm -hmm. they just, they just, Same true. Okay. Uncle Alan, I remember having a, a good sense of humor, uh, not the shock and oaths and things. He, mm -hmm. he always had hum something humorous. To, yeah, he, and Alan always had a cookie jar. Yeah. Yeah, Alan always had a great gift of conversation. I can just still see him standing over the hog barn in the state fair. He just loved to visit. Yep. Loved to visit. He used to love the, the cottage cheese that Alan made. Yes, he did. For some reason, the cottage cheese she made was the best cottage cheese I ever had. The only thing I eat cottage cheese like anymore is Anderson Erickson. It's pretty good. But Aunt Alan's was always yeah, the best. Yeah. She made it on the back of the stove. Yeah. yeah. That's the same thing. The back of the old cook stove. <coughs> Any other special memories? Whoa. Whoa. Grandma or Grandpa, or I should say your mother or father? Well, a lot of them haymaking time. I can remember if it was an extremely hot day, my Uncle Alan always went up in a haymow and he would just come out of there. <coughs> and the boy, we'd set, we'd set the fork and we'd, we'd trade off and shock the oats. But I can still remember him coming out. And, Little ice cubes on his wrist. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Cool Pull himself down. But nice mm -hmm. He was always sick that night too. He just knew he was going to be because he got over it. He didn't really mm -hmm. need dust. Mm -hmm. But their parents were just like, hi. Yep. Yep. Yeah. One thing I'd like to throw in here at this time, because Pauline mentioned that they worked together a mile apart. I mean, they just worked together on everything including, you know, all the harvest and everything. I remember one incident when I was in a country school and they were picking corn down at at, uh, at our place and uh, they had a wagon load of corn and they had the mules on that wagon and the mules balked and uh, they wouldn't pull the load. They got as far as they were going to go. And uh, so Uncle Alan that was helping some way and pretty soon he went up and got the old Ford tractor he came down, he backed up to the front of him, took a log chain, and this one mule was balking. Threw the log chain around his neck like this, and he took it up in the kitchen the tractor, and he put it in gear, and he started going ahead. The old mule's next time going like that. <laughs> All of a sudden, he decided he could move. <laughs> the one was tried already, but they both started pulling. They pulled the wagon out. He had hooked the chain, away he went. <laughs> one, one thing that I think the both probably told me, when I was learning to drive, that you had to have a little more sense in the mules if you're going to drive them. Oh, no, I must have been one where we learned how to teach the cows, but <laughs> if we walk to the fair, <laughs> I'm behind the hair, actually. <laughs> you remember any family reunions where everybody oh, got together? We used to have big family reunions. We were in Landis Park in Brooklyn, and there'd be, how many would there be in there? Oh. I mean, <laughs> we had relatives some Everywhere, yeah, more everywhere. food sitting out there. And a lot broader base than now. I mean, had the Madison Playground in Landis Park. And, uh, and at that time, you had a, a broad base of Breckenridge Ridges and a lot more. Where now it's, it's pretty much the descendants of mostly Russell and then Holly and Allen. Mm -hmm. yeah. and the other brothers and sisters that go way beyond, uh, you don't see them. We used to have a lot of fun at the Madison Playground, too. Oh. Friday night ball games and things, and things that were going on. And the 
uh, forage or uh, July 4th picnics, remember down the playground? The yeah, parade and, and everything. And parades. I remember one year it, it rained, just really rained hard. And it's about the time the oats would always be ripe too about that time in oats are going. Well, we didn't know if it was going to be wet. But mom had fixed us. We had taken crepe, crepe paper and, and decorated the boys' tricycle and the wagon. You and I, we had this wagon all with things. We had even had crepe dresses made, crepe paper dresses and a hat and pulled, would it be Jack and <coughs> Jack and Larry or Jack and Maynard? Jack and Maynard, Jack probably. And, Maynard, and you, had the, you had the tricycle and it was had decorated with crepe paper all around the wheels and everything. You had that all ready to go down to the playground for the, for the parade that morning. And there'd be a big picnic, a bit of dinner at noon with everybody around. And then we had fireworks out in your grove too after the 4th of July. And then you always walked the grove because he just afraid there's some parks that got into that grove. Every night after we had the fireworks, my dad would because mm -hmm. it was right on our farm. Mm -hmm. You know, those good days follow through. They used to have these ball games. They'd go down to Maples Grove and they'd go to all different places around the township, 4-H and what have you. The first week we came in here, the lady came down the hall and we liked to be friendly. And Gilford held out his hand to some lady that was coming up the halls. We were going down. And says, I'm Gilford Moore, and she says, yes, I know you. Her husband and Gilford played ball together over the, when they were younger. Happened to be Les Lutman, one of the better pitchers in softball. And his wife his lives wife across, across the, hall. the hall from us. And her kids went to school with our <coughs> kid. It's a very small world when you get in, in a little place like this, and you know just how many people that all involved back to Farm Bureau, for age churches, just country games. People remember, and the lady remembered him working in the grocery store. That was for we were married. It was just kind of interesting. And all kids playing, it. went to school with our kids. It all comes down to the good times we used to have. Our parents took time to take it to them and enjoy it, where I think that's missing today a lot of times. Mm -hmm. I know some of you are, and I mean, follow your kids wherever you go, and to the ball games and hoop and holler and sit in the rain. We did the same with ours, now we're doing it with the grandkids and great-grandkids. We got another one due, by the way, this next month. Good. Mark, Good. Joanna. <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> that makes great, great. We don't want to advertise it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be too great, great. Right. So. Uh, we, well, we played, played ball down at Madison Playground. Uh, we played teams from Sheridan, yep. Westfield, Chester, Chester uh, uh, South Brooklyn. Remember one time, Junie and Merle and Manat and Elmer Ford all lived in town. They brought a team out to play us. Usually we only had sign the time. We usually had one good ball and one practice ball. You know, he didn't have ten balls. Mm -hmm. And we had a hole in the screen back there. If you missed it, you get out through there. Somebody had a foul ball. We spent a half hour looking for that ball so we could resume playing again. But we had them every Friday night. And oh yeah. Sometimes on Tuesday. And we uh, Really ice, cream, to, ice cream social down oh yeah. there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We look forward to going down there. Table of electricity and things that it cost. That was everything. our social life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, a lot of yeah. fun. After World War II, it all changed. Yep. Everything centered around town and school. Mm -hmm. We make homemade ice cream up here once out of once a month. Uh, we didn't get to go to it. I'm going to have to try that. <laughs> yep. It tastes like the gallons and gallons we used to stir together for or Christmas when they have programs and make fudge and candy out on the porch to feed your parents. A lot of good times. Is this, this is an opportunity too to find out both sides of how, how come Merle got hung on the fence. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'd be the girls. <laughs> they were they were the culprits. Tell, ask them tell what, what have you done? <laughs> I got in their way, I guess. Are, are they pleading innocent or here? I, I don't think they understand what I said. Huh. What, what, did, what did you do to poor Merle? We know what you did to Larry. Uh -huh. 
Huh? What did you do to the poor girl? The story is that you, you two hung Merle on a fence one day. I just wondered what happened. <laughs> well, this was, one of, this was one of Mother's favorite stories. Uh -huh. She told about that she had sent the girl there outside to play, and she put me out there with them, and they were to look after me. I, did you believe and, that story? <laughs> <laughs> I remember it. I got the stars to show you. Are you sure? <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, after a while, Mother came out looking for me. And she saw the girls there. They were playing away. And, and uh, she said, well, where's Merle? Well, he's over there. <laughs> Mother went over there. We had a, a yard fence all around our yard with a barbed wire around the top of it. I don't know whether it was to keep us in or keep what it was to keep out. <laughs> But anyway, and I was sitting there hanging by the bed with my shirt on the barbed wire, just as happy as could be, Mother said, that, that I was just as happy as can be, but I was just hanging there in the fence, looking around the world. I was up high in the world, you know, I could see them. <laughs> and they were playing their way, and I wasn't any concern to them. <laughs> I think they hung me there on purpose. It wouldn't surprise me. That wouldn't surprise me. Yep. yep. Okay, speaking of playing, Grandma Lang used to tell a story about how she got out of doing some dishes because she and, was it Aunt Ruth, wanted yeah, to Ruth. play? Can someone tell that story? <laughs> you haven't heard oh, it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Merle's going to tell it? Yeah, I'll tell the story. Anyway, she and Aunt Ruth were told to clean up the dishes after a big family dinner, I suppose, of some sort. Well, was it Grandma Emerson's on that? I think it probably was. And so uh, they got in there, and just the two of them were there. So what they did was they washed one plate of each different size and took the plates and stacked them in the shelf and put a clean plate on top of them <laughs> and left. <laughs> We're done with the dishes. <laughs> and Grandma Hendrickson then came out to see the next time to get the dishes out and pulled the top plate out and there's a dirty one. <laughs> there's another. I guess they caught a little... little Wash them all over again. And she wouldn't know which one was dirty, so they had to do it clear to the bottom of the dirty bottom. <laughs> I can see why they did everything. Just mm -hmm. two mm -hmm. Always that way. Mom and Dad was involved. Your mother and was. Okay, another story. Um, Grandpa used to like to tell stories, and there was one that uh, they that when Grandpa was dating Grandma, and Uncle Henry was dating Jean. And there was a Halloween party. Who wants to tell that story? Well, there was two or three stories. That was the, the well. Go ahead. No, I don't know if that was. Well, I, I think Uncle, one of the men dressed up like the other one, and they switched. Gene and Henry uh -huh. did the switching. switching. <laughs> yeah, they tricked each other not to know who was, which one was which. Uh, Gene and Howard were always into something like that. And uh, one time, they, I have a picture of them where Jean was trying to climb the ladder, and Howie was up where they were supposed to get to. And he had a sprinkling can, and he sprayed, kept her down because he's kept spraying water down. <laughs> but they were always doing something like that. So it was a Lang thing, not a Hendrickson. Yes. And what it was, they dressed somebody up, uh, either Dad or Russell, in a girl's outfit, and Russell spent his whole, Henry spent his whole night squaring what he thought was Jean around. Was, it was either. <laughs> I think it was your dad. The dad. First things first, there's the hemp story and now this. <laughs> okay. All right. Think about your kids. Which one's the one that's the most full of mischief as they go along growing up? I have come to the conclusion looking over all these old pictures that Dad must have been the Dickens. I don't know. He would. He always had something. A little bit mischievous. Well, he was even after his son in law once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> so Tell us about it, Gilbert. <laughs> well, he had a way of getting through to you pretty easy and still. It was kind of funny, and, but he was making his point. We, Evelyn and I lived down south of town, and they had recently paved our road, and they went out six miles and stopped because that's all the money the county had. But the farm down in Madison was still on the gravel, you know. So he came up one day, and we sat around the table and visited a little bit. Finally, he said to me, he said, uh, you know, Gilford, you must have a pretty good political pull. And I said, what are you talking about? 
Oh, he said, you got a six feet of pavement that goes out here six miles and it don't go anywhere. It just ends out there. He said, somebody must have a pull somewhere. So he made the point. <laughs> then I also want to mention when, when we were sitting at the table that noon, Howie and I sat on one side and Mom and Grandma on the other side. And uh, I don't know why, but so I said, I happen to have a little wine in the refrigerator. Would you like a little? And Howie said, well, yeah, that'd be nice to start the meal. So we got a little glass about so big, set around all four of them, and I put some wine in each one. Well, that was fine. So as we proceeded a few minutes longer, I said to Howie, would you like a little more? Grandma says, no, he wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, I believe I'll have a little more. Evelyn, Evelyn didn't want any more, so I poured another half a glass for myself, see, but I didn't drink it. <laughs> when Grandma wasn't looking, I just kind of slid over this way and changed glasses and took all this pear. I guess one of the stories is Larry probably is fortunate to be here because of the bowl incident. And was Guilford there and Uncle Alan there? Who? I don't know that story completely. I just know that he's fortunate to be alive. No, no, I'll tell you. I was in the hospital and had Steve, and they had Bill and Jean out at their place that day. And I was up in the hospital, and uh, you were there, you were out there anyway, and Daryl was standing there, and he looked out the window, and he says, some of your folks are coming up to the steps there. He says, I wonder what's going on. So he hurried out to the hospital room to go down and check and see what it was. And the bull had gored you, and, and uh, Gene and Bill were down, were there, staying at their place. So I, I suppose they brought them all up to the hospital then because they all come running up there. I wonder if the story what you're wondering is when they got, loaded the bull out to sell him, Uncle Alan had a gun along. Yes, that's, I, think I think that's what you're, is that what you're facing for, Chris, probably, maybe? Yeah. Uncle Alan was ready to shoot him if the bull didn't go in the truck. Inside. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I walked a little right beside him that day. Okay, well, that's, that's right. what they're wondering about. I'm sorry about that. Uncle yeah. Alan assured him that if that Uncle little... Uncle Alan, I stood way up by that fence, cleared up to find him. Uncle Howie said, Howie says, I'll go out and we'll turn him loose. Well, I'm not going to say the words that Alan said to me, but uh, <laughs> when the bull came loose, came out of the... He went right down there to that new building that we had built for him. He went right down across there, and Uncle Alan followed that bull along with that... Not a 10, 410, it was a 12 gauge. And he had it loaded and ready. It was all cocked, and we walked carefully down there. When that bull went through, that was all there was to it. But had that bull made one move, he got buckshot just so fast it made your head swing. I remember I knew it. Got rid of it in a hurry. Yeah. I mean, took it to market, and then I know that fall, most all the cows got dehorned. <laughs> I remember Aunt Louise was up in the hospital and she sat with you day and night for two or three days there. I was yeah. in there yeah, during the day. Yeah. I remember first day. No. Well, Larry didn't fall. I went up to see him that first night and I passed out on the hospital bed. <laughs> <laughs> She was hitting me with a wet rag. I don't know where she got it. <laughs> Sitting right on top of me going this way. <laughs> I, got, yep. I got a question. How did uh, Larry break his arm off that step there at the old milk house? <laughs> She's telling me. <laughs> we had, I don't know, we, we had a thing of some sand maybe around there that we were mixing sand or something. It was right outside the milk house. Well, is that a leftover uh, sand pile from our pole vault? Oh. No, but the board is about this high. 
I can remember yeah, calling them when I was just looking just like that, and I thought that something was wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Were you there? I read, what happened? Well, I don't. I think that was from when Gilbert lived there. I, we, for quite a few years, we had a, a Olympic set up there. We had pole vault yeah. standards and shot club and hurdles. <laughs> and, 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 Why? Yeah. We had a sand jet to land in if you went over it, and I think maybe we had a board around some of that sand, and that it, it cards the, that broken arm. I think Larry chipped on that. And on the old mattresses. I had a question there about the band music, and Gilbert, he was talented. He could play a banjo and a saxophone, and the rest of us, we just... You played the juice harp. Juice harp. Yeah, and yours, that thing vibrating back and forth, all of a sudden you stop them. <laughs> yes, I tried to play a harmonica, and Jack played a Coleman paper, I believe. <laughs> we had a lot of talent. <laughs> one of our strong points. Big expansion. Yeah, it's a I made it like to tell the story about country school of music and how we learned our music. Go ahead. Well, they, they sent us for this old Victrola on records about this square, and you lined it up. And you had Billy Boy, you had Sweet Kitty Clover, and you had the Camp Town Races. And they'd been there for 10, 15 years, and you had a crack in them. Mm -hmm. So we'd stand there and sing, and pretty soon, Sweet Kitty Clover. Uh, well, let's just say, Oh, where have you been, Billy Boy, Billy Boy? Oh, where have you been? The coal's winding down, so we <laughs> and then it crack, crack, crack. <laughs> that was our music education. Then we had a piano was out of tune, and I'm not sure. Did you know how to play the piano? Not very well. No, Vera didn't. All of them. But we had a piano sitting there. First of all, it was out of tune. The teachers didn't know how to play it, most of them. Uh, and so there was no music education. <laughs> but the, with regard to teachers, the teacher in those days and age, you come to school early, you stoke the furnace, you did all the janitor work, clean the work. That's why you get us to clean the blackboard. Pauline, Pauline and I are first teacher. That on record. <laughs> all, I of, had, all of Abel was my first one. I had Merle. When I was a, when I was in eighth grade. In eighth grade, and I had Maynard on the. As, and you the one that caught me. I wore short pants to school, and Wallace leaned over and he smacked me with a ruler like that. Uh, I didn't on, have Wallace. On a bare leg. No, she didn't have Wallace, so it wouldn't. You didn't have Wallace. Oh, oh, I said it was all. And then, just like a basketball foul. I was, I retaliated. I smacked Wallace, and I was five years younger, they caught me. <laughs> what was the punishment? Well, I don't know. I remember I went home with a 76 on deportment one time, and that's the only time I ever heard Dad really mad about report cards. We well, always used to love to go down the, that one hill on Uncle Allen's property take a long noon hour and carry our sleds down there. Mm -hmm. And if our, over, if our boots had holes in them, we'd stuff paper in there to keep the yeah. snow out so we'd stay warm. Carry our sleds down there and we'd crawl over that fence. And the snow was really good. You could slide clear down to the creek. Yeah. The creek was just frozen over. We used to love to do that. Yeah, uh, yeah the two things about that, that hill's gotten smaller every year as they get older. <laughs> 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 the second thing was they'd stand all those first and second graders over that one register. And I'm telling you, you think you miss air conditioning. You ought to stick <laughs> ten, wet, ten wet first and second and third graders over top of one register in the one room school. It was a big five foot register, five and six foot square register. That's the only register in the whole school. We're going to dry them out. <laughs> Boy, you were just lucky to have a furnace down there in the register. Most of the school well, had an old pot belly stove up in the middle. and everything else was wet over there, too. On there, I know. I had ask a question to somebody over. Now, there was a barrel in the basement. At some time, they had tried to inst and put in a indoor outhouse, but it, it was out of existence. And the barrel was still hanging there. Did any of you ever use an indoor did you remember, Pauline? Did that ever be used? I didn't remember that. I remember it being used, but most of the time it didn't work very well. So we used the outside. But they were installed in No, no, no flush water, just simply no, an just indoor outhouse. Chemicals. Yeah. Never used. I know. 
so. One year we had 21 children, kids, in the country school. It was teaching. We had all the grades, and one lady brought a little girl, and she insisted I teach her as kindergarten. So we had nine grades and 21 children. And I was, I don't know how I did it, I was only 18. Who was, it, who was the lady brought? Grand. Huh? Grand. Grand. <laughs> she brought her. Live, live right across the road, you couldn't do anything else. I couldn't do anything. I just admitted her. It's all my records all up, I know. <laughs> but she just did it. So that was it. Anyone else have any questions? Any other, any other comments or anything else? I think we've kind of chewed up some time here, but we've learned a lot. I know I have <laughs> sitting back and listening. Wanda, I bet, I bet if we had a lot more time, the boys would tell a whole lot more things that they did growing up. I know one other time we got to talking one day and we left this and went over to Dorothy's and I heard a lot of stories that Maynard and Jack told when they were going to high school. Well, I hadn't heard before. <laughs> they didn't have anything necessarily to do with the folks. <laughs> you want to share any of the stories now? Or? Uh, Why don't you uh, tell them about, uh, didn't you have a fox? A, a pet fox? Or a little fox? Was it a cat the coyote? Or, uh, we a coyote? We went over to Allen's one Sunday for dinner and we went out in the hill and dug up three or four oh, half coyote. wolf, half yeah. Yeah, half, half wolf pups. Yeah. Elwood kept one, Gilbert took one, we took one. Anybody else did? And I was gone. And all three of them got to killing chickens and eating eggs. And they had a short, they had a short surprise. Our short lifespan? No. Yeah. Didn't Sandy kill ours? Sandy killed ours. They came up and tried to drink out of the same bowl right outside that old portion of the Sandy was our dog. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Just pup was being out of range, just one snap and broke its neck. But Gilbert and you, you sold yours somebody, didn't you? Some guys, Southern, Southern Iowa wanted it worse than we did. <laughs> he could lay out in the front yard in the grass. He wouldn't he'd grab a chicken, you know, he'd, he'd wait and get off in the grass just like a fox and a wolf would, and he'd wait and then he'd creep up a little bit. And there's that, you know, fryer getting about big enough to fry, get up real close to him, then he'd make a little bit of move and the thing start to go, he would ride up there and grab him. We found a new home for him. I don't think I made a lot of money on that deal. At least you didn't have to waste money on a bullet. That's with an old setting hen and sitting on eggs and respecting my eggs on it. I peeked in on a snake curled up in there. That was the only thing about that farm we moved to up there mm -hmm. shared and up the creek and every time it's gonna rain the snakes would move up the hill. We didn't have I lost a whole bucket of eggs and I flew that I didn't know I could fly. <laughs> <laughs> out on the hay rack set in the floor and we had a little trouble with the rope up there and of course it overhung a little bit and all of a sudden I heard Howie yelling at Maynard. So I come to the door and Maynard was turned out on that thing looking over the top. He'd go on top of the barn looking down and Howie was about ready to have a fit. <laughs> driving the team, you know, horses, and then hay would get down our neck and not stand there. but the worms, too. 
<laughs> Snakes and worms. That was part of haying back then. Yep. That was part of haying back then. Well, it took a lot longer to do it. it. Took a whole week. If it was a good week, to put up 25 acres of alfalfa, though, you'd break a small little bit in one day, and then you'd cut a little bit in the morning, and then you'd turn it, turn it over. <laughs> took a long time to get that in load by load. I think it's really nice that uh, all of you guys who uh, thought this up did this because I always regret that uh, never had this with Dad. Mm -hmm. And Mom wrote some stuff once, but never had anything from Dad. Yeah, right. And he could have too. So, you bet. Well, we appreciate everybody sticking around and well, sharing some of their memories. Maybe we can do this another year or two and